Hi, my name is Reem. Um, I met Luis uh, over the summer for the first time when I went on a um, caravan to Cuba. Uh, we uh, met in Mexico City uh, and traveled to Cuba and traveled all throughout the island. Um, so, uh, one of the many projects that Luis is involved in. And Let me share with you two very interesting projects that we had in the church and then we take it from there. Uh, one is that uh, in the 90s, when I was at St. Anne's Church, this is the so-called uh, uh, Congressional District Number 1, the poorest Congressional District in the, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You find statistics there that you do not find in third world countries. You know what? You do not find in so-called third world countries. Uh -huh. When it comes to deal with education, poverty, uh, uh, unemployment, forget it. Everything there can be worse. Uh, the reality of finding uh, the so-called third world country inside the first world country. But then one common denominator, uh, black people, Latino people, white people, but they all happen to be poor people. They are in the same basket, living in the projects, or places that they've been excluded. And then this, this, this has been the most heavy community, one of the most devastated community with the HIV. Because the issue of heroin in that community, and more specific with the uh, uh, Puerto Rican community and the black community. So we were there accepting the challenge. How can we get this church because it's a question that any, any, anybody who's running a group is supposed to start there. It can be a social club. It can be a, a church. How can we make this institution relevant to what's going on outside there? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that immediately we went was, it's a reality, they're not going to stop using drugs. So why the hell am I going there with this message that you need to stop using drugs? Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm. They said, let's try, and this is 1990, the harm reduction at this moment was illegal. And harm reduction it was not just the issue of giving you clean needles and you give me your dirty needles or giving you cum. It's also about teaching you this is your body, how to respect your body, the, the nutrition, uh, medical care, everything. And the best place to bring the drug into your system. You can't tell anyone you need to stop using drugs. However, if someone, they are there, there to say, I want to stop, oh, we have the whole team immediately. We're going to get you. We have the place. But can't come out from us, that initiative. Uh, some people, they really had a lot of difficulty with this project, especially coming from a church, uh, because we're giving our needles. Uh, we're giving our karma. Uh, our excuse was, well, but we're not just giving our needles or karma. There is a blessed needles and blessed karma. That was better. <laughs> 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 you know what? I don't have any conversation we went into. <laughs> so, how, how is that this blessed karma are better? So, you know what I know. <laughs> <laughs> so people really took it literally, you know. <laughs> We're just trying to make sense there. Uh, again, it was illegal. We were hiding the needles. Uh, first, we were getting the needles from Australia. It was not possible to get the needles in the U.S. Uh, we don't have a license. So we were getting the needles from Australia under the category of religious material. Mm -hmm. And then we were hiding the needles. That church, St. Anne's Church, they, they, they have a big cemetery. So we were hiding the needles in the, in the grave. <laughs> so the police never went there. They were always asking, how the hell are they hiding the needles? So that was. But then we, we had some good people uh, running uh, anthropology research. And that's when we came up with that strong research that uh, close to 80% uh, prevention, reduction in the uh, epidemic. And the government was in shock. Immediately they say, okay, we need to check if this is true. 
they went, they checked, and then they came out with something that we were happy, but when we were illegal, it was more excited. They started giving us money. Now we're running a show, the show there with that project that is, I think it's about $4 million coming from the government. Uh, and we're doing a good job, but I think it was more excited when we were illegal. Hiding, <laughs> <laughs> running away from the police, and uh, uh, that kind of thing. So that's one of the mystery. The other is the street gangs. Uh, we went there. Uh, let me learn. We need to learn from these kids. Because this is something more. This, these are our, our children. Why is that everything in the gang is being criminalized? And that's when we started learning from them. Uh, and that's how we ended up writing that book. That is still very controversial, but it's the first book that came out in the academia here in the US. Uh, the analysis of street gang as a social movement. Uh, we discovered that there, there's no definition for street gangs. There's not an official definition for street gang in, in the US. And we were a little stuck. How are we going to define this? And then uh, the leader of the Latin Kings, uh, King Tom, uh, in New York, uh, had got into a conversation with us and said, so what's the issue? He said, we're still struggling here out there, we're going to define street gang. He said, I have a definition, if you want to use it for the book. He said, what's your definition of street gang? He said, street gang in New York City is, you take eight or ten black kicks or eight or ten Latino kicks, you put them then in the corner, that's a street gang. <laughs> and, well, if they happen to be white, that's a hockey team. <laughs> they said, Man, this is very interesting. We went into asking police officers. No so matter, it can be white, black, Latino, police officers. Okay, you're passing by, you see this group of black kids or Latino kids hanging in the corner. Oh, I get suspicious. That's the first reaction. Mm -hmm. I get suspicious. So, okay, so why you get suspicious? So what are they doing there? There's something illegal being there. There's nothing against that type of assembly. Yeah, but no. I want to know why they're doing that. They don't want to say, it. it's just because they're black or because they're Latino. Okay, they don't want to use that word. But they say, we're trying to see if they can get it. What make you feel suspicious? They don't want to say it. It's because they're black. This is a racial profiling. Okay? It's because they're Latino. No. It's okay, but if they are white kids, uh, well, there's a lot of tourists that come into New York City. Oh, so there's a lot of tourists that come to New York City. That's very interesting. <laughs> so you don't get suspicious. No. <laughs> very nice. Okay? So that was part of that conversation. But it was very interesting because in that research that the government was not happy, and they, they, they're not happy uh, with that particular research, one of the things that we learned, uh, especially with this group of the Latin King, which is supposed to be the most notorious street gang in, in, in the US, uh, we went with four questions. One, what is a street gang? Uh, the government can't answer that question. Okay? So, we got a definition from the children, uh, the kids. We're not a street gang. They said, what do I say? We are a street organization. <laughs> oh, okay, and people have a right to define themselves. We like to define people from the outside. Mm -hmm. We need to find a way how to stop doing that. Start asking people how you identify yourself. Okay, and you're gonna be surprised. So they define themselves. That's why in the book we talk about street organization, not street gangs. We learned that from them, not about them. The second was why they emerge. We were asking police officers, because we have federal government uh, and a uh, uh, gun intelligence unit, we have local gun intelligence unit, we have inside the prison gun intelligence unit, we have inside the school system gun intelligence unit, there are all kind of gun intelligence units. But the message is alternative to gun, which means this is wrong, you have to eliminate that. And what we learned from the, the case is that there is nothing wrong here. Yeah, you have some people who commit crime, like in society, and that's what we found. Okay? 
that there is no connection between committing crime and being affiliated to uh, a gang. What we found was that you have more uh, young people who are not affiliated committing crime than those, but then they the stereotype that project things in a way that this is the end of the world, these three guys are taking over the community, they destroy the community when it's natural. Okay? Uh, so we, we never found uh, 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 people coming from the government uh, a concrete answer why they emerged. What we found was, I don't know why they emerged, but we need to get rid of them. Why the hell you need to get rid of something that you do not know? Because I don't like it. Now we're talking. You see? That's different. So, you're going to go against anything that you don't like? You can imagine what kind of society we're going to have? If everybody's going to take that nasty attitude, then I'm going to go out eliminating what I don't like. And then, the other question was, why these young people affiliate to these groups? The official answer from the government is to commit crime. What we found? Something different. Family. There's an incredible way of putting together. They, they replace the family. And that's one way to show you this uh, family crisis that we're having, especially here in, in the U.S. So this is not my family anymore. I'm creating the alternatives to my family. And now the oldest one happened to be my new fathers and my new mothers. And all of these happened to be my hermanitos, hermanitos, my little sisters and my little brothers. It's a new family. And because it's a new family, also I need a new name. And they all change the name. And you can go into things like uh, I gave uh, different people, about 20 scholars and social workers, I call it. They said, listen, this guy called himself I said, Latin King, he called himself King Killer. What do you think he called himself King Killer? Oh, they went into seven war. Probably he killed, I don't know, this amount of people, or probably he liked to kill. I don't know. Then after they finished, we told them, he told us that he liked to call himself King Killer because there's a lot of things, wrong things that he needed to kill in his life. They were shocked. <laughs> they were in shock. And he started by saying, one thing that I need to learn how to kill in my life is my addiction to drugs. In other words, that he, I know I have a very serious problem with domestic violence. I don't know how to talk. Okay, so it's not only because it's my wife. I, 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 I do it with everybody. I start fighting immediately. I become physical. I learn that you don't talk. You start fighting. So I need to learn. They told me that there's another way to do things. I don't know, I'm not there. I need to learn. So I made a decision that I'm going to call myself King Killer until I kill everything that is wrong in my life. They said, wow, well, this is very deep. Okay. So then, the last question was, and this is the biggest issue in the book, how much crime is gang related? Are you aware that in the US, the official statement is that close to 1% of the crime is gang related. <clears throat> close. Are you aware that 17% is connected to domestic violence? Why is that 17% is not important than, than one, like 1%? One Why is that we don't have intelligent units inside the school system to teach against domestic violence? Why don't go there? Are you aware that it's close to 10% hate crime? Uh, we, 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 I work very close with the uh, 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 gay <coughs> uh, anti-violence project. The statistic is still the same. 75% of crime against gay, lesbian in New York City, 75%. It's a crime that someone thought that you were gay. And they beat the shit out of you. They attack you. Okay? Like this case that we had last year, these two Ecuadorian kids, 
One is in the West Coast, the other is in the East Coast. They can't come together. They're, they're undocumented. Until they got the paper, and now we're going to get together. After five years, living in the same country. The same day, and they're so happy that they are together again. Because this is my problem. Okay? And they're coming out of the building, hugging and kissing. And there's this group of young people passing in the car and said, Look at those five. They got out of the car with baseball bat. They killed one. We had no idea how the other one survived. And then this kid, you no, know, who was only 16 years old, who was part of that. You can see the, the, the stupidity there. Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought they were gay. So he's sorry that they're not gay, and he did it. Because if they were gay, they deserve that. This intolerant society. You see? So that's part of that issue, but that's not a concern. The concern is with so called street gap. So I stop there. These are two projects that I just want to share with you so you can have a clear understanding what else we're doing there, especially when it comes to deal with uh, groups that they really going to challenge us. Young people always, always going to bring the challenge. I was a challenge as a young person in my generation. But my father, my mother, they were challenged. Challenging my grandmother and my grandfather. <laughs> you were challenged. We forgot about that. We don't like to talk about that. Okay, I don't know why. But we need to talk about it. What do you think? <laughs> Reactions. Oops. Well, this is actually more of a question. Um, one of the things um, of trying to work with myself personally, work with um, you know groups who are trying to um, well groups that are working on immigrant rights, for instance, or on, um, in my case on economic justice issues like the Band of Rebels here. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so one of, but the, one of the things I've been personally wrestling with, I think, because of, you know, what's going on, and it just seems to get worse and worse, so um, is the question of direct action and civil disobedience. And one of the things that I'm not a very creative person, so I kind of intellectually know and actually have personally done direct action kinds of things. But I really loved your story last night, and maybe you could tell it, about the garbage not being delivered in the mm -hmm. South Bronx. And I think what really struck me about it was the tactic was so perfectly fit mm -hmm. yeah. with your goal. <laughs> it wasn't just civil disobedience getting out there and doing something just for the sake of doing it, but it was uh, was one very creative, uh, was actually humorous, mm -hmm. and which I really think has a big place in direct action or should have a big place. And it was effective. So I would like you to tell that story and then maybe t if we could talk a little bit about tactics. Okay. Um, because I think a lot of us have been doing this stuff, even the younger people, for a long time. And um, there's that creativity that needs to be in the movement that I guess I feel like we all need, and maybe especially the older people, need more of. Well, first... Tell them the story first. Not, yeah, not the older generation, the less younger. So in the South Bronx, uh, we were trying to no, legally, and the commitment from the government in paper is that you have to collect the garbage every day. There's too many people inside those projects. Uh, we produce a lot of garbage. We we calculated that probably uh, each person produces 30 or 35 pounds of garbage every day. So you can imagine. Thousands of people living there. How the hell are you going to deal with it? They were not collecting the garbage. One week, two weeks, and then you see all these racks. Heavy racks. They look like cacks. 
okay? You have to look twice before you say, it's a rat, it's a cat, okay? So we're trying to have a meeting with the commissioner, and she's not paying attention to us. Okay, we know that, but we go all the channels, you say, because then people are going to start asking us, uh, you went through the channels? Um, we know that. So let's go through the channel. She's not going to give us the appointment, but let's go through the channel. Blah, 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 blah. We're not getting the appointment. Okay, now let's go for the action. It has to be an action that is going to get the media, it's going to get the major look bad. She works for the major. The major is the one who's going to call her to see if we have a meeting. So then that's when we say get 400 people, uh, and each one of them, 6 o'clock in the morning, with two plastic bags of garbage. We're going down top with all the garbage inside the train. Okay, first, that was a serious problem. People can't get inside the train. So people started calling and complaining. We want them to complain. Because sometimes people live so comfortable, they're not being part of the solution, but you're being part of the problem because you're not, you're not helping me deal with it. So I, now I'm going to give you a hard time. So now call the police or call the major, complain to them that you have some people in the train with all this garbage and you can't be go inside the, the train and now you're going to be late for your job. Okay. I said, we went there in front of the building. And once we stand there, it's already 6 o'clock, that's 6 o'clock in the morning, we started dumping all those garbage uh, back in the front door that nobody can go in, nobody can come out. Of course, they arrest everybody there, but then the major was not the media was there and interviewing, and the major is looking at this, and the other's going, no, so they call the commissioner. I want you to take care of this business in media. That's it because we, everybody, they said, when the media talk to you, always say this, we're coming back tomorrow. You can arrest us. We have four, 400 people coming tomorrow. They come tomorrow? Hmm. We need to stop them. How the hell are we going to stop them? So we need to sit down with them. For them. So they said, hey, sit down with those people. Fix the problem. From the prison we went back to her office. It's already 7 30 in the morning. What we didn't accomplish in one month. Okay? We did it and before office hour, 7 30 in the morning. And they gave us breakfast, I don't kind of think. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice in that meeting. They said, oh, I like this place. You know? <laughs> so this is the problem. This is the solution that we want. It's 7.30 in the morning. Before 8.30, you can count all these garbage trucks to the supper. Just because we said, we're coming back tomorrow. Okay? They don't want us to go back. Because when, in a strategy, when you keep the problem in the same setting, it's not affecting the other. So you get the problem out of that setting, and you bring the problem to them. I'm going to bring the problem to you. Here we go. So we brought you the, the problem. And that's how we got their attention and how we got all the trucks there. And we found a solution to the problem. And then we were just keeping records that they were doing what they were supposed to do. Because we're paying taxes and you're supposed to collect the garbage every day. Not every week. Every day you're supposed to collect the garbage. Okay? And that's how we won that particular strategy. The whole issue is this, when there's oppression, you always need to find a way to build resistance. You can use your creativity. Anybody here had that gift, she has to find the best way to do it. And you connect it. Uh, can be something like, pass is aggressive. I hate washing dishes. Okay, uh, I grew up with all these women, and that was part of the responsibility. Uh, but I, th I discovered that it was not the so-called gender issue because then I like to wash clothes, and I don't clothes. I, don't know. I like to because it was like a therapy. Okay, <laughs> so we have this conversation, all these men with my grandmother, and having conversations. But that's what we do for living. For living. But washing this, I hate this. So I said, how can I get? away from this one. There goes the resistance. I'm trying to fix this problem. I have a problem. Right? This is a personal problem. I don't want to do the tissue. So I go into washing the tissues in a way that they still got it. <laughs> 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 and then my grandmother comes and says, 
Yeah, they said, shit, you don't know how to get, get the fuck out of here. Yeah. Now I'm washing the dishes. And then she take away my responsibility. I said, yeah, that's what I want. You know? <laughs> my mother don't do that. Oh, you have to watch that again. You can be two hours there. You gotta stay two hours there. Okay? And I take away your responsibility. My grandmother was a little more soft with that. Okay. I won that one. The other way my grandmother was this. She, uh, this is the way she used to punish me. First she beat the shit out of me. Okay, <laughs> naked. You have to get naked. Shut up. And then she started counting. I hate that. Counting. One. She already told me that it was going to be ten. One. <laughs> I'm like, you, you have experience with that. <laughs> Two. So there you go. We're still missing eight. Three. Until, and then after that, you know what she likes to do? She likes to embarrass me. So she bring one of her dress. Put on this dress. And then I have to stand in the back room in front of all my friends. And they make in front of me, passing by. Ah, look at the woman. Oh, that kind of shit. I hate that. And she knew I hate it. So I say, how can I stop this? I need to find a way how to stop this. So one day, she's, she, she was cooking. And then Don Ruben, the guy who lived in my community, say, hey, Doña Barbara, what the hell is wrong with your grandson? They said, what the hell is wrong with him? What, what he did? Oh, he's standing in the corner there with a dress. <laughs> <laughs> standing in the corner with a dress. Okay, so she goes there and says, So I got, I'm hanging around with all my friends with that dress. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, What the hell is wrong with you? Grandma, I think I'm gay. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> she went in panic. She, oh God, oh my God. Don't want to take out that dress. I'm not going to take out this dress. I like human dress. I said, I don't like it. Either. But I'm fighting, you know, what she's doing to me. So until I got it. Then next day I go there, where is my dress? I don't want to see that dress. But she said, get the fuck out of here. Okay, you're not wearing that dress anymore. I want my dress. I like you, my dress. <laughs> well, later on, you know, when we grew up, that, that was some of the story that we sit down, but it was just resistant. Check your way of doing resistant, especially with your families and those people. Yes? So, going back to the talking about gangs, and I mean, what I hear a lot of is that really it's fear. Everything is a lot of it's fear. You know, so putting an easy label or easy solution and get rid of it because I don't like it or because, maybe not because I don't like it, but because I'm scared to death of it. Yes. And we have, I mean, we have a huge escalating problem with violence in, in this city, mm -hmm. um, especially among young people. You know, people are shot and stabbed to death a lot. And, like, over the last week, there was, there was a, sh a, a shooting. Um, no one was hit, but in the very crowded center where bus transfers take place. Maybe you heard, maybe you've heard about this no, since we're here. Um, but that was a big thing like less than a week ago, I think. And, and there's a lot, a lot of very large fights. There's a lot of menacing with guns on, in school that people don't hear about all the time. Um, but it's, it's very bad and it's becoming like, Groups of students who you normally wouldn't have seen, like historically you wouldn't have seen fighting, it's become like escalated into like a whole way of, like you were saying that the person called killer just wanted to fight first. Yes. It seems like that added that way of being is like pervading people, no matter what. My husband broke a fight up on our street the day before yesterday, mm -hmm. and he ended up pulling someone away. It's his nephew. <laughs> who was who was one of the aggressors, right? And it's just way out of control. And the predictable response is more police. They think they're going to fix the bus transfer situation by moving the bus stop to a place that's more um, contained physically by buildings, so the students can't run away like down different streets. So they think they've got a physical geographic solution 
Um, but, but really more police, more police, more police, more punitive measures, more suspensions, more, you know, security state things. And it just is overwhelming because we know, you know, we know what kind of solutions we really need. Yes. We know the kind of work that really needs to be done, but it doesn't feel like there's any nucleus of strength to get to get the direction shifted. I don't know if you have any in my They don't label anybody. There's no explanation for gangs. This way, they could throw anybody in that category. Oh, yeah, gang right. Right. Oh, yeah, we gang use, yeah, they want to. Right. Um, we, have because, a, we have a strategy in the city. The DA uses um, RICO to prosecute oh, yes. young yes. people of color. Yes. I'm sorry, Ricardo, I didn't mean to yeah. cut you off. Go ahead. No. My nephew is 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 gay, mm -hmm. and so what he does is he has a few other friends. There might be eight or nine of them that are gay to defend against the hate crimes coming their way because it still happens. People want to beat people up just because they're um, sexual preference. They they band together, hang together for safety, but now they're labeled a gang. Yes. You know, because it's a few of them together, and, and it, it's then once you label them a gang, if they happen to get in trouble, they're going to get penalized way more than the average citizen. You know, so it's just, it's a no, no win situation, and they should um, have a definition of a gang so that somebody can use Because if there's no definition, I can't fight back against it when you say, we're a gang in here. Matter of fact, if this all been black folks up in here, it could have very well be they could the gang unit could be coming to oh. do the raid. <laughs> but the closer we get to a definition of gang in the U.S. is uh, a group of people, which means that right now, <laughs> right now, this is what we are, and we're just coming out of another gang there in that church. There's a lot of people there, so. <laughs> but again, there is this discrepancy when it's blacks, Latino, when it's white. Uh, you have to understand how is that they play with this because uh, they don't use the same category for the KKK, white supremacist group, paramilitary mm -hmm. group. They are not under the category of gang. Why not? These are criminal guns. But no, they do not go there. And that's why you have to get very skeptical of that. With this issue of violence, uh, we used to have a so-called uh, uh, violence reduction program with young people. We wanted to change in the approach. Uh, because first they had the police saying, we need more police officers, more prison, longer sentences. This is, this is the so-called war crime. And then you say, OK, let me check for one more. This is going to reduce crime. This is going to eliminate crime? No. You can go into the literature in criminology, criminal justice, more police officers, more prison, longer sentences do not eliminate crime. Forget about uh, reducing. So why are we doing something that is not working? Second, you need to find a way how to analyze this from the real perspective. But they saw it, half of the information. Yeah, this is the reality. But if there's something else more complicated, yes. Like for example, this week we were just analyzing, yes, we have all these, this reality of uh, adolescent pregnancy issues in New York City. You have these girls, 14, 15 year old, getting pregnant. So there's a whole campaign to target young people. So when they say, let me tell you why this is not working. 95%, I don't know here, but in New York City, 95% of these young ladies coming out pregnant was an adult who got her pregnant. Yeah, it's here too. Why the hell are you running the campaign? An adult. Someone that's supposed to look at her like, this is my younger sister, okay? Or this can be my daughter. No, what I see is an opportunity, okay? And I take advantage of that opportunity to have sex with this uh, minor, and she's ended pregnant. So you can't run the campaign 
with these young people all blaming the victim, saying, keep your legs closed. My friend, this is more complicated. Mm -hmm. Get these adults understanding that you don't do this. Why are you not running the campaign, us, adult men? No, they don't want it. They say, that's part of the issue. Mm -hmm. With this issue of violence, the reality is that the culture of violence in the U.S. is all over the places. Used to be that it was only males, not anymore. Right now, the production from Hollywood, now we have this new character, female character. Look at the Charlie Andrews. Look at that. Now we have role models of female kicking asses. And a lot of violence. I don't know if you saw that movie, Colombiana. Yeah. I don't know what the hell she learned how to do that. It was like in her blog. Okay, that because she she was never in the school to learn how to kill people and all that kind of shit like that. They said it's like uh, now you female you also have role models because this is the way you're supposed to find solution. We were in the middle of that project talking about alternatives to violence, conflict resolution, and having all these kids. Uh, passing through uh, uh, John Jay to get a certificate in conflict resolution so they can become expert. In the middle of that shit, Iraq. In the middle of that shit, the president of the United States saying, we're going for retaliation. That's what they always say in the community. <laughs> now, how do you explain that shit now? Huh? We're trying to help them understand there's alternative to violence. No, I'm going for retaliation. I'm going to get you. And oh, you want to see those kids. Hey, that's what we are. You see, it's not that bullshit that you're teaching us here. Okay, that's how we need to do. Let's go for retaliation. Why do we need to talk? He said, there we go. It was like a sun kind of backslash in the middle of that we educated. Okay? So, what we don't want you to see is the issue how violent this community is. I'm sitting there in New York City with all, I, I brought two different groups uh, against domestic violence, and I'm telling them, listen, when you look at this issue in a heterosexual couple, uh, probably 95 or probably more of the victim happen to be both. Uh, the perpetrator is a man. Uh, Let's get into gay lesbian community. No, we don't want to deal with that. Why not? Okay, I don't know the statistic here, but in New York City, it's close to 65 percent uh, 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 gay couples, lesbian couple, finding way a uh, solution to the conflicts by using physical violence. And now you see a, big, a woman being victim of a woman, or a man being victim of another man in a relationship, and you have no idea how the hell you go to the prison. So they're not prepared to deal with this issue. And when you go to programs in the community that are supposed to deal with this issue, they're not prepared. Because you go there as a woman that your partner beat the shit out of you, and then, well, where's that guy? And who the hell told you that it's a guy? Huh? Or when you go there as a man also complaining, mm -hmm. they can't believe that you are you letting your woman beat the shit out of you? No, it's another man. Are you gay? That, that kind of reaction, they're making fun that really discourage people from this search for uh, justice. Where I'm going with this, the issue needs to be that we can't sit down here waiting that some kind of things like that is going to happen. We need to be proactive with the culture of peace. We need to get into inside the school. We need to get inside the church. We need to get inside these uh, clubs. We need to get into those who produce music. Uh, because this is one of the biggest issues that we have. Mm -hmm. Yes, we have some, let's say, hip-hop, rap, that really makes sense, but we have a lot of hip hop rap that do not make sense, perpetuate that cultural balance. So some people is get people getting benefit of this. Okay? And then I remember in my times, used to be something that they call uh, PL, 
police athletic league. Mm -hmm. But it was prevention. First, those police officers can't come into the community with uniform or the weapons. No. I must tell you, you're not aware that they are police officers. It's prevention. But the biggest issue that they were doing was homework. Because it's so stupid. It's like, uh, and you need a PhD to know that? NYPD telling me, why crimes goes up after 3 o'clock? And <laughs> 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 um, not only after 3 o'clock, well, not always after 3 o'clock. Because Saturday and Sunday is higher. But then, legally, school is supposed to be open until 9 o'clock because children are supposed to have access to all these things that we have inside the school, including the pool, the basketball, and everything. No, they close. They don't come inside the building. And now you're asking me why crime goes up after 3 o'clock. So you, you really want me to tell you? Or oh, the issue of during summer, this is out of control. When the school is closed, uh, Father, we don't know why crime goes up. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so again, the cause you of peace. We need to start teaching people how to talk, alternatives to battle, a conflict resolution, instead of kicking ass and breaking head. We need to start you know, training people how to become peer mentors. We get the first group of young people and they take the other. We're doing this with John Jay and the we with Dennis and TK. <coughs> They become experts in this yeah. issue, and they go out teaching. They can find solutions to this uh, issue. But then what we found is that there is more violence in adults than in young people. We do not highlight that in the media. Mm. We give the impression that this generation, well, first, this generation is a scapegoat generation, mm. and we're not going any place with them. There's no future. I don't know what else is going on with these kids. That's wrong. That's not the way. Because it's, we're lying. We have a, 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 a generation of people that we like violence. Mm -hmm. right. Here or there. Yeah. I um, heard you last night talk about when you were a legal immigrant and before you got deported and you came in, you every time. When you were over here, like, illegally, mm -hmm. uh, every time you went near a building, you had to look and see which way you was going to be able to run if immigration came. Um, and just things that were your mind had to stay clouded with. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel free from that now that you're legal, or do you still... Will you jog, say for instance, will you go jogging at nighttime without your ID? Because you don't want to go through the harassment that's coming with, you know, the ice. You know, because like me, I don't have that issue, but I have an issue of not going through the harassment. I find myself, if it's nighttime and I'm not right here in the city, I'm going into the store, I'm pulling my wallet out before I enter the door to give them, calm down. I'm just pulling out my wallet, I got money, I'm not going to rob you. Yeah. These are, it's like overwhelming to always have to be thinking of these things. Yeah. Uh, and I just want to know, do you feel free or is there, are, are you, do you still have some concerns? Do you still got some defenses? Can you go jogging without your ID in the wrong area? Not, not in New York City, believe me. Uh, I've been there, standing there, I'm a full-time professor with John Jay College. I'm a priest, okay? I've been standing there in Midtown, trying to stop a taxi. With I your stop, car on? Uh, with your car yes. On? I stop a taxi, I'm trying to stop a taxi. The person in front of me there on the sidewalk is white, or the other behind me is white. They can stop there, they can stop there. They are avoiding me just because I'm black, because I'm Latino. And not only because the taxi driver is white, it can be the taxi driver is a Latino person or is black, mm -hmm. because you can internalize oppression. 
This is one of the issues that we need to start working on. You can find people going against what you're doing that you're going into saying, they're supposed to be next to us. They're supposed. So that's one issue. I've been stopped and frisked I don't know how many times. Just because I'm black. I've been, I'm going to take the train and sometimes they have these checkpoints there to check your bags and I'm going inside and all these white people going there. It's, hey, you, you, yeah, yeah, you, you, come here. I want to check your bag. Hey, it's all these people here. So why the hell you need to stop me? Of course, I never, I, I give them a hard time. I don't stop. You have to arrest me. Okay, that's part of my civil disobedience action. I'm not going to stop. What you're doing is illegal. Arrest me if you want. They don't want to do the paperwork. Okay? Or being stopped when I'm driving. Yeah, because of racial profiling. And I, I, I go, I always go into the basic question. Uh, that's part of the racism. Uh, the basic question is, officer, good morning. Uh, I'm going to give you my driving license and my registration. After you tell me why you stopped me. I'm exercising my rights, but because I'm not white, he's going to tell me, or she's going to tell me, that I'm trying to be slick. Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm intelligent or I'm trying to exercise my right. It's that I'm trying to be slick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be slick. I'm exercising my rights. I have a right to know why the hell you stopped me. Okay? And let me tell you how you got the wrong person. I don't give a damn shit if you want to arrest me. Let's go to the prison. You're going to waste some time there. You have to do the paperwork. And I have a lot of books there that I have to read. So I'm going to start with that. Okay? And I can sit down there. We've been in that kind of situation. Six, seven, eight hours. And that's when they get more pissed off. Because I, I know this thing. What he's doing? He's reading. How the fuck he can sit down there so quiet? He's not asking to make a phone call. He doesn't give a shit. Oh, they really hate that. <laughs> that's my way of fighting that. <laughs> Okay? I'm not going to let you get into my system. I'm going to get into your system. I'm going to deconstruct that stupidity power that you're trying to use against me. I know how to survive in your city. But a lot of the young people, they don't know. A lot of the new immigrants, they don't know. So this is part of my responsibility. Teach them. That's why they can say whatever they say. They want to say, I always go to them with a smile. And they really hate that. Why are you giving me that stupid smile? <laughs> You're not going to get me there. Okay? And I respect you. You're the officer. Okay. And I'm going to give you my paper. That's it. Arrest me. And like I said, I'm not resisting the arrest. That's why this is a civil disobedience. Because I'm not resisting. I'm taking the consequences. And I'm giving you my paper. So, yes, just keep this in mind. It's not correct to talk about this post racist society. We're in the middle. Don't get confused. Yeah. That because you don't see the signs after the civil rights movement, and we have more names for the sign. Blacks are not welcome. Uh, Asians are not welcome. Latinos are not welcome. Women are not welcome. Gay, lesbian, they're not welcome. We have all kind of signs. Young people, this is a, 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 a war against young people. We're still saying that they are immature. <laughs> We, we regulate everything like uh, having sex, the use of uh, alcohol, the, the, the use of uh, uh, smoking, uh, getting married. Oh, we regulate everything. Because we understand that you are immature. But when it comes to sending you to Iraq or Afghanistan, you can be 17, you are mature, you can kill. Or you can't have sex. Or you can't have a beer. A, this is a serious contradiction that you bring here. So yeah, we, we had this uh, uh, self-proclaimed model entrepreneurs people that they really wanted to run the show, okay? <laughs> How things they supposed to be. Everybody is supposed to behave this way. Uh, this is how you deal with your sexuality. There's only one way. I believe in God. Uh, and this is your, the way you believe in God. Blah, blah, blah. Okay? And 
yeah, you can be black, but we want you to behave like you are white. Mm. You can be a woman, but we want you to behave like you are a man, because this is a male chauvinist society. Uh, you can be gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, or, uh, but we want you to behave like you are straight. And then they dare to ask you, because I've been there, because this is about identity, it's about making point. It's about my resistance to give you a hard time because you're rejecting my identity. Like a professor was asking me, I want to learn more about, uh, uh, to understand where you stand. Uh, why do you always need to remind us that you are black and you are Latino? Oh, that's a good question. Let me tell you why. Because I'm black and I'm Latino. Because <laughs> 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 it's the same thing. Why you always need to emphasize that you're gay or you lesbian or gay? Why we need to hear, okay, because I'm gay, because I'm lesbian. That's why I'm trans. But people in power, the so-called uh, ruling group, normal group, always is going to disqualify your struggle. That's why when you read the media, you see, there was a fight between black people. If, if they're white, they don't say that it was a fight between white people. They say, people, why you have to emphasize that they're all black? Or they kill a gay man. If it's a straight man, you don't say that they kill a straight man. Why do you need to emphasize that it was a gay man? Because that's the issue, those who believe this is normality. And that's violence. You see, we have more structural violence than personal violence. But the emphasis is into personal violence or interpersonal. That was the issue with that project that we created there. They said, why do I need to emphasize only personal or interpersonal? I want to include structural violence. So they learn. Because there are two institutions that I want to target here. One is the Department of Education and two is the police. They produce violence against our community. Oh, they don't want me to do it. He said, yes, this is a project against violence. And then we convert it. So we're not going to talk anymore here about violence. We're going to talk about the, the culture of peace. <laughs> oh, we sit down. This is in Washington. He said, we're concerned about your project. There's supposed to be a project to reduce violence. OK, and what's your concern? He said, that you converted the program into a peace uh, cultural project. And I'm waiting. So I said, they're not getting the point. Mm -hmm. Until one of them came out very straight to me and so said, What is the connection between the culture of peace and reducing violence? That's when I said, Wow, we're in deep shit. <laughs> and I get in the message. They're very concrete. Blind people. Okay. Who's, who's they? I'm sorry. Oh, the people who were giving the money from the federal Department government. Department of Education? Uh, no, in that case, it was the Justice Department putting money into uh, anti-violence project. But they want me to emphasize that. And I went there with this understanding. These are black and Latino kids. I don't want to continue using that label of violence that gives the impression that this is only a problem with us. I want to use something else, OK? The cultural piece. When you go into the description, you're going to see that is our way to reduce violence. They say, no, we want from the top. You have to say that it's an anti violence project for blacks and Latinos. I don't want to do that. And I'm not going to do that. So they tolerated me for six years, then they take the money away. <laughs> <laughs> they took the money away? Oh, they take the money away because we went into a, a demonstration against the war. It's like, well, we're against violence. <laughs> I know because <laughs> I know because uh, you know, it's, it's exactly what you know when you're talking about you know building a culture of peace as a solution and then then you're expressing very concrete examples of self determination and assertive you know confrontation with the police. If you're if you're saying the solution to violence is building a culture of peace and yet you're holding you know a value of assertive self determination, mm -hmm. which is all right and what we need to do, you have to have like. I don't know if you call it political education or yeah. um, whatever label you want to put on it to interpret. 
And like when you're saying you're doing the peer peer counseling and Iraq is invaded, I mean, you have to have an interpretation from from our side of things. Well, we to, use to a lot of uh, Paulo Freire, uh, pedagogy also. But then they'll shut you down. Uh, which is well, exactly, yeah, you know, that's another issue. Different. That's why you need to find a way, at least during that time, to find uh, ways to produce money that you do not depend on mm -hmm. them. But uh, this is a reality. If you are going to depend on these people, they are going to strangle you. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can experience is economic dependency. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest issue for keeping, let's say, slavery. Mm -hmm. When they said, okay, this is it, we are enslaved. More than 90% of the slave uh, black people say, I'm staying with my master. Because one, where the hell are we going to be? Uh, what the hell are we going to eat? And then people went into taking advantages of that, similar to domestic violence, that 95% she is coming back. But what's the irresponsible response? Oh, she like that shit. That's not the point. There is something more powerful here. When you are connected, economic dependency, my friend, they got you. Okay? Uh, so you need to find that economic independence to, to really talk about sovereignty. That's how the U.S. controls most of these countries, especially in Latin America. Okay, with all this free trade agreement, it is economic dependency, so I can get you dancing the way I want. And you have to play the game. Mm -hmm. Okay? And a lot of them, they, they don't believe in what the USA foreign policy is saying, but they put in the money. And a lot of people, in, good people in the community with good program, you find yourself there saying, how are we going to deal with this? They're not going to give us the money. Or they're going to keep up. They take away the money. It's a very difficult situation. Uh, you need to find ways. Uh, for that time, it was supposed to be a uh, two years grant. We did it for six years. We found a way out and renewed it without giving up the agenda. Okay? So, yeah, that's the biggest challenge. But you can't. In activism and justice, you're not supposed to compromise your dignity or your integrity. Once you get there, you're losing your humanity. And we're going down the toilet. That's what happened with a lot of the programs, especially coming out of the system. They find a way how to accommodate themselves into the mainstream society. And they betray the society. They betray the communities. Very good. Yeah, uh, question of... <coughs> The society and government controlling our private lives. Can I open another can of worms briefly? What about gun control? Right. Well, that's another issue because then uh, uh, most of what you find there, like for example, I was reading in the show, they gave me one fly that talked about gun violence and other kind of stuff. That one of the issues when people come into the community to take away the guns. Okay, first, this is what we found in our research that most of the people, young people and adults, not just young people, they have weapons. They have weapons, but very rare that they're going to use it. But when they use it, the media have a way to inflate. That gives you the impression that this is the end of the world. <laughs> this, is, this is the end of the world. They're killing people all over. That's not true. Okay? People, <laughs> we have more people dying because of something else. Like what we were, no, no, uh, it was, I don't know with whom I was talking, that here in the U.S., every year, between 100, 105,000 people die because the physician gave a wrong prescription. Oh, yes, right. Why this is not important? <coughs> it's not important because it's structural violence. It's under the so-called category of white collar crime. I don't know who the hell came out with that bullshit. <laughs> no, it's like a, this is acceptable, this one is not acceptable. So you have more people dying after all this uh, regonomic that uh, there's this agency that regulates issues of uh, uh, environmental protection. Mm -hmm. This one? The EPA. Yes. Yeah. This is what happened with this organization. We have more than 400,000 people, 400, people dying every year. That's invisible. 
That's structural violence. That's corporate violence under the category of crime. We don't talk about that because this is race people. Okay? Street crime is a baby. It's nothing. But we're going to highlight media hype. So give you the impression that this is the end of the world. And also because give you the impression that you need protection. And we're here to protect you. Yes. And then you give up your civil rights. Yes. Uh, because there is no way we can protect you if you do not give up your civil rights. That's not correct. Okay, that's, that's a way of controlling people. Like you can't get there. I got a question about, um, so I, got, I have a number of friends that live in New York City, um, and uh, it's in, in one sense it's happening everywhere in the country, but particularly in New York, is the growth of the police state. Now you have like, I mean, New York and the NYPD is a small army, right. not even a small army, you know, it's a pretty sizable army. Um, when we're dealing with that, like, um, and then Rochester as well, like, you know, there, there's always, there seems to be unlimited funding for whatever the police want, you know, um, but there's uh, at the expense of everything else. Um, you know, when I was younger, I used to have this, like, really fuck the police attitude, right? <laughs> Which is, I, I think, I think is natural um, uh, and, and justified. But, like, that, that, that's not, that in and of itself is really sort of a, um, a strategy. <laughs> you know, I think, I think we don't have the forces, we don't have the numbers to confront the police uh, on a, on a on you know the battlefields that we that we find ourselves in, whether it be protests or um, you know criminal justice, we just had a case uh, in in Rochester where this uh, um, this uh, black gentleman was beat up by the police, uh, and he was uh, not after he was beat up, he was charged with resisting arrest uh, and disorderly conduct, um, and was recently um, forced to take an S ACD. Um, for for and, and, you know completely unjustifiable. There's no there's there's no consistently no um, there's no accountability or anything like that. We're looking for ways to do that in Rochester, but um, it's a very slow process. Uh, and I question sometimes whether that's that's the that's the, the right because we're talking about a lot of investment. When you're talking about like you know um, these building building an alternative institution. Um, so you you teach people who are going to be police officers. Yes. A lot. Um, yes. What is what are the what are the, what are the other ways in which to engage? Because uh, it's this opaque institution. We know a lot more about the prison system. We know a lot more than uh, more about the, um, the the judicial system. Uh, like we we know we know we, like in some ways these other areas are pretty are, are pretty transparent to us. The police is not. It's a completely opaque institution. There's like there's almost no we have no idea what goes on inside the prison <laughs> um, and how decisions are made and what. Um, how accountability is is, is dealt? Uh, like, it, it, um, are there ways to figure out figure out how that happens? It seems like, you know, we have these people. They they, they start out as people. They and then <laughs> they go through this process and they become police officers and they're completely removed from the rest of society. And all of a sudden, you know, they're like they see the rest of the population as their enemy. Um, yeah. I, I just don't like are there any any other approaches to this. Well, Question of how to deal with the police department. I mean, if there, mm -hmm. there's there's no way that we can ignore that. And, uh, no, we can't. Kind of we can't. And we need to target them. Uh, one of the things that I always doing activism in the community always remind people: uh, these police officers, they are our children, <coughs> our daughters and son. That a ruling class managed to get them facing us and they hiding behind it. And then, the confrontation is them and us. And we think that they are the enemy. They're protecting the enemy. So this is the first place that you need to start analyzing. The other is that, let's say for example, the more I go into talking to them, they went there for a salary. This is the option for blacks and Latinos in New York City, becoming police officers. Uh, and then you see that they want to get out after four or five years. Uh, they're just looking for an opportunity. There's no jobs. It's similar to going into the service. There's no job, okay? That explains and that justifies. Uh, and then the other issue is I have this opportunity. I can get them inside the classroom. And like one told me three, uh, two weeks ago, and this is just the beginning of the semester. Say, I don't know how the hell you're going to handle the pressure in this course 
uh, for the rest of the semester. They say, I hate that you make me feel guilty. <laughs> say, oh, I'm getting some place. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm not telling him that. Okay? But I say, oh, sorry, Daddy. I'm glad. I'm so happy. But when I'm sitting there, they say, I'm going to get you. Okay? And I go there and say, you have to write this paper. Probably hate that. Okay? Uh, or let's be real, because it's most Latinos and, and, and uh, blacks. Who went through this experience of stop and frisk? The police officer. They've been there. When you do not have the uniform, because what the hell is a police officer without a uniform? Huh? So th now they don't know who you are, and they can stop you. And they can bring you through the same oppression until they discover who you are. Because I've been there. I remember uh, I committed a mistake uh, in 42nd Street between 8 and 9. There's four white police officers standing there, 6 o'clock in the morning. I was still sleepy. I dropped a friend there, and I make a U-turn in front of them. <laughs> they, like, they look at each other like a... <laughs> like God said, you don't really have balls. You know? <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? You want a challenge? Or you're looking for a fight? They said, Officer, listen, I'm just sleeping. So I don't know. You're right. You're right. What I did is wrong. Then they come down. Uh, give me your driving license. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I went to get my driving license. When he saw my John Jay car's ID, when he saw the. You are John Jay? He said, Yes. Are you a police officer? They say, how am I going to answer this one? <laughs> <laughs> what you think? Ah, he's one of us. Let it go. Come on. <laughs> I, never say, I never say that I was a police officer. Okay? I just what do you think? Huh? <laughs> he assumed that I was a police officer. Ah, he's one of us. Now, I'm not black anymore. I'm not Latino anymore. I'm a police officer. He's one of us. Listen to that. All white police officers say he's one of us because it's a whole culture. They're protecting themselves there. Okay? And that's what I hate. So, <clears throat> one of the things that they also hate, we train young people with the video camera to follow police officers <coughs> in the community. Okay? Mm -hmm. Oh, they hate that. They really hate that. So I say, what the hell are you doing? Say, oh, we're just shaking on you. <laughs> okay, you came here to check the community? Yeah. So we want to know what you're going to do. And we begin to say, this is illegal? No. So, forget it. Oh, they hate that. Okay, so that's one way to tell them, I'm shaking, I'm watching you. Okay, that the other is that we open forum, like this one. And we bring police officers. We want to talk, because you live here. Is one of our children. Okay, so we do not want to go into a rejection automatically because it's a police officer. I want to deal with political consciousness. I want to get you in our side. I know that you need a job, but you don't need to do that shit in the community. So you need, you need to learn how to do things here. Okay, and to be honest, we have more positive outcomes because we go into humanizing the issue. That you don't look at me that I'm the enemy. I don't look at you that you are the enemy. But I'm watching. Okay? I'm paying attention to what you're doing. So don't come here doing. So that's another thing. Prevention. Educating people, but also educating them. Okay? If I can't get you in the classroom, I'm going to invite you. Or we're going to have something here in the church. Uh, they have to sit down there. Oh, we buy them to sit down with the Latin kings and yeah, the Sulu, the Crips. They say, how much you know about them? Ah, I know a lot about them. How much you learn from them? Nothing. Sit down. That's two different things. Yeah, there's a local story here. Uh, there's a woman in, the, in this area, her name is Emily Good. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, never, a number of us know her. <laughs> and uh, she had an altercation with the police. And somebody had the presence of mind to video it. And she, no, she, she did. Video. She was yeah, doing she she the video. video. She was doing oh, it. Oh, that's right. She was doing the yes. video, and they tried to arrest her for it. And she they went through the kind of process you're talking about. She is now running for sheriff. 
Oh, that's good. <laughs> in the Occupy movement, we part of that Occupy movement. Well, police officers really hate. We got all these people well trained uh, to talk to them. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, listen, my friend. You're part of the 99. You're not part of that one person. So what the hell are you doing here? Oh, they hate that kind of comment, and they're trying to avoid. It. But the issue is they can't move out of there. This is your spot. So I, I know you can move your head. You can try to ignore me, but I'm standing in front of you, and I'm going to talk to you. And you have to listen to me, okay? Because I'm not being disrespectful to you. But I'm going to preach to you what you're doing is wrong. You're part of the 99%. Oh, they hate when we got all these uh, 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 kicks. Uh, the major sent all these officers to do arrest there. We sent all these kicks, and the message was start hiding and kissing police officers. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> they were not expecting that one. Oh, they're going to do something. Be ready. Okay? Be ready to we can we're going to fight here. Oh, oh, this kid, hugging and kissing. Give me a hug. Give me a kiss. <laughs> and they're looking all over the places, you know, like they don't know how to do it. Okay? So you find ways to go through with the message. So, yes, I can talk to them in the street. Uh, I, I can go into re-educating. It's a slow process, but it's possible. But when you do this, don't just do it with uh, uh, just community people that they are not police officers. Try to find. They don't want to come here. Uh, let's go there. We're going to go to the prison. We're going to, we would like to have a conversation. We have a group of young people, of course, you prepare them, okay? That they can go there, and with a smile, they can confront that power. They're not scared to talk. This is how I feel when I see each one of you in the community. But when I see you, I get scared, because I don't know what the hell you're going to do to me. They need to hear this, okay? So this is another way to start raising consciousness. So, we have to do it. So. So our, our experience in Occupy in Rochester mm -hmm. was that um, whenever we confronted police officers, we had a number of people, there's there always a debate whether we should engage the police um, or whether we should just be stand, you know, just stand clear until we have to, <coughs> until we have to interact with them. Um, and we found that the police officers that were assigned to come to the encampment were actually there for one thing, and that was to gather information about the individual activists. Um, okay. To be used against them in the future, if necessary. Um, that was that was the kind of that was the kind of interaction, and so um, so that's, that like that wasn't an option for us uh, in, in occupying uh, in Rochester, anyway. And I think I think a lot of other things as well. Um, there's just this level of um, there's an incredible amount of distrust uh, yes. for good reason. Um, oh, yes. There's there's, yes, yes. there's there seems to be no opening. For for um, for engagement at all um, in many cases, and I, I just don't know how to get past how to get past that. We're not gonna like it's like fight or flight every time <laughs> we see them. You know. Okay, you can go there also with teachers standing in front of them so they can read. You can go there with flowers in the Occupy movement, and also because this is part of the training. Uh, let's say in prison, uh, when I was in prison, I said, I know why they change this, uh, the rotation of the uh, correctional officer. It, 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 it's classic. They can't be there. The prison population is going to start raising consciousness. Then. So one way to avoid that is that you have to rotate them. Um. In the Occupy movement, they have to rotate them because they, they become sympathizers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and one way to avoid that is to don't send the same police officer. So we know that, so we find a way how to deal with that. If we can send out a quick message that can go through, and some, is, for some people it's going to stick there. Some people they don't really give a shit, but some people, at least if I can get one, that's enough. We start there. It's a common middle And I uh, learned last night in this presentation last night just being fair. I'm not some pro police. Y'all know that. <laughs> you know I mean? But be it fair, um, the story he told um, about the, the lady, you know, 
please to go to ice people, yeah. please um, <laughs> don't arrest me. I have I kids, kids. I got kids. This and that dropped the tears and everything. And so he turned around to deal with somebody else. And when I turned back around, you'd be gone, basically. That's what he said. And then she said, you're under arrest. I'm an officer. And you're not following procedure. What? Um, so, you know, this is what he explained last night. So this is making them go to the extreme blue. Extreme blue. You know, whatever you want to call it. And it's just... So there's no trust on their part. There's no trust on my part. We can't. That there's never gonna be no line of communication. But, but they're getting all of us fighting each other, and they're not. Yeah. They're not the big enemy. The big enemy is behind them. Yeah. But they put them there in the front. Yeah. Okay. It's like uh, so. We want to get rid of, let's say, Saddam Hussein, and we want to take the oil and petroleum. So Bush went there to fight. His children went there to fight. No, we're gonna get some kicks. To do the dirty job, and but of course we're gonna tell them that they're fighting for justice, for freedom. okay, for freedom, for democracy, and then they go there repeating that nonsense. Yeah. Then you have to start raising counsel. You're not fighting for justice. You're not freedom. So you want to fight for freedom? So stay here. <laughs> and let's start a revolution here, because this is what we needed. But then it's it's kind of brainwashing. So yes, yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of work. And let me, let me tell you something, every time I find one of these kids that want to become a police officer, say, okay, here we go. So at least I try to tell them, listen, if you stay with a bachelor degree, you're going to go into a position implementing policy. They don't want you to go for the master. You know why? Because with the master, you go into producing policy. Mm -hmm. And if you have the capacity to produce policy, you're going to change the system. So I encourage them to go. Graduate school. You have to go into graduate school. Going to law school and stay as a police officer. Continue escalating. We need to change the system. Okay? We need good people on the inside. We already have enough bad people. So that's part of my encouragement to them. But if you want to become one more. Uh, and let me tell you one statistic. Well, you know how to handle it. It is here in the US. Between 1 to 3 percent police officers, they are criminal. They went there to commit crime. They, it's not that they became criminal. <laughs> they, they were criminal <laughs> who went there to commit crime. 3 percent, <coughs> practically that's nothing when you compare with 97 yeah. percent. What's the problem with the 97 percent? They silent. Silent makes you guilty. Okay? And I have more problems with those people. They say, I know they get involved with this. I know they're selling drugs. I know they're killing people, uh, those officers. But I'm not going to get involved. Why the hell are we paying you? Why is that you do not dare to do arrest another police officer? When Amnesty International investigated uh, NYPD in New York twice, which is a shame, I came out with the same conclusion. The problem is not the 3% committing the direct crime. The problem is the blue cold silent. 97% that keep silent do not dare to come out and make the accusation. We need to find a way how they break silent. And let me tell you something. It's still controlled by white people, especially Irish and Italian. But when it comes to deal with the uniform, they're going to stand next to you. They don't give a shit if you are black, Latino, woman, gay, lesbian. You have the uniform, you're one of us. I've been there. Looking at this, he said, this is a very powerful dynamic. It's a very close club that they protect each other. When it can, and that's why the blue silent code. Uh, so I don't know how they do it here, but it's very difficult that another police officer is trying to come out accusing another police officer or arresting another police officer. That's the way it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. okay. So. We done? We okay?
Yes. I I guess I am thinking also, you know, because I see this, um, I see the escalation of violence in the the media as a direct, um, basically because there's increased violence in our, you know, in the institutions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the weapons that we use. I mean, we have military weapons on our streets now. Right. Um, and I, I look at, you know, because we have to accept these, you know, the violence has to escalate in the media, so we get immune almost to it. And um, it, it just seems to me that it's very hard um, to, to get out the, the idea that there are alternatives. And um, especially with, you know, the media is so controlled by a few corporations who are, you know, also sell the weapons and also, you know, and, and also the whole idea that, like, you know, I mean, I w I'm disgusted at, like, you know, the exceptionalism, you know, that they talk yeah. about. Yeah. And that Henry Kissinger is still, you know, used <laughs> as somebody who, you know, has wisdom when he's a war criminal. Yeah. And it just seems like this, it just keeps perpetuating. And it seems like sometimes it's, you know, just, you feel like going, you know, <laughs> what is it? What, what can we do? And, and it's that, that um, I see a lot of activists getting burned out. Oh, yes. That's the biggest issue. And, and you know, trying to solve that, you know, and, and work on that issue is, you know, they're, you know, looking for the small gains and saying, you know, the small gains will add up. Like, you know, with the take back the land when they, even with one, you know, one day of reprieve on an eviction is a little victory and but it, it just seems like the burnout rate is so high because you know we're so passionate this is so important to us but yet it just seems like incredible well, odds this is a permanent job <laughs> get that in your head there's no retirement there's no vacation you can't give up okay uh, because it's a permanent job. You have to be very careful not to go into this reality of burnout. Uh, you can avoid this. It's possible. But you need to learn how to do this as a community activist. I remember one of the first training that I got as a community activist, they told us, I think it was about October, and they told us, bring the calendar from next year. We're going to start putting activity there. So it's one of us, bro, the calendar. Okay? And it's a year calendar. So we were in shock when these people started saying, okay, the whole calendar is clean? Yes. Okay, find your birthday and mark there that that day is free. Now find your mother's birthday. That day is free. Now find your children's birthday. Find your significant order. Ah, and also write there your two weeks vacation. And this, we were not ready for that shit. We were in shock. Because we're not used to that. We like to take care of other people without taking care of ourselves. You can't give what you don't have. You can't. Okay? And this is something that I learned. It took me a while. Okay? Uh, every time I was going to take a plane, that I read that sign, in case I'm an emergency, uh, you have to put on your mask first, mm -hmm. and then after that, you take care of the children and say, what the hell are they saying that? My children goes for it. Okay? That's most of the time how we function. And they say, say, okay, let me see if I can get this thing. It's, there's an emergency, and I'm trying to rescue my children and put in the mask and everything. And I don't want to be first. I want them to be first. Let's say that I collapse because I don't have air. What's going to happen with it? They also run down the toilet. Now I got it. It's not about being selfish. You see? 
this, this is a very serious enemy in community activism. We don't like that. Stay away from that. It's about self-preservation. You need to take care of yourself. And a lot of the people, when I sit down with them, that they are born out, they say, let's try to understand what they all happen. They, they want to run the revolution, the whole family is upside down. My children are jumping out of place, I don't have any relationship with my children. Uh, my significant other is going to divorce me, and they're going to tell me to get the hell out of here. And say, the revolution is going to start in my family. This is where I am. I can use that as an example that I know how to organize. But it's the opposite. I deal with uh, uh, neglecting those people that I love. I go into neglecting myself. I don't visit the doctor. I don't go to the dentist. I don't take care of myself until I collapse. And then it's worse. Why is that I'm not taking care of myself? So this is something that we need to talk. And talking about relationships, you see, because an emotional problem can destroy the movement. And now, we, we need you. And you're in the middle of some kind of family bullshit issue. That not only because it's a family bullshit issue, it's because you created that tension. Because hmm. yeah. you're neglecting the person that you're saying that you love. So we need to go into all these kind of things. It says, how are you dealing with your children? Okay. When was the last time you really have a quality relationship with your children or your significant other. They can't mention it, so we're going the wrong way. Think globally, act locally. In community activism, you need to memorize that. Some people like to think globally. We're going to change the political system in the US. I'm not doing nothing in the community because I want to target the political system. Yeah, I want to change the political system. Where is my action? In this community. This is where I'm going to start. Here. This is where I am. This is where I'm standing. I don't need to go to the USA Congress. Later on, I'm going to go there. I need to start here. Okay? So think globally and act locally. That's it. If not, you're going to get lost in that young group. And you're going to feel that we're not getting any place. I don't see any progress. There's progress. Okay? There's progress. People change for good or for bad. Okay? That slogan that all dogs do not learn new tricks, I don't believe in that. That's why I became a psychologist. I believe that someone can be 80 or 90. That person can learn. You know Monsignor Romero in Salvador? Yes. You need to understand that Romero became a bishop because of the right wing reactionary bishop. The last three years, okay, 77 to 80, he changed. But what happened with the other year? I don't give a damn shit about those years. I really appreciate that he changed for good. Because some people, they change for bad. They can be 50 years during the revolution, and the last three years, they are foolish. And they turn around, became the enemies. Okay? I like when it's the other way around. Okay? And that's, I really appreciate. When you look at Romero's life, he said, damn, this man changed. So you, so you changed. don't give up on anyone? Never. 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 Yeah. I, I, I work a lot, especially because of my, my brother. I grew up in a community where drugs was all over the places. It was nine kicks. We have already six at the cemetery. Three die of AIDS and three shot. Okay? But I remember all the time that they called me to go to a drug rehabilitation center. And I always got this attitude. Probably this is the one. Okay? Probably this is the one. Okay? I'm not giving up on you. I always told them. I'm not giving up. That's why in this type of work you need a lot of patience, dedication, compassion, and love. But in order to get there and stay there, you need to recharge the batteries. 
And this is the biggest issue when you do not recharge the battery. Okay? And you start hanging around with people that they're going to take away the little inspiration that you have. And now we're going down the toilet. Start hanging around with people who really can bring more energy to you. Uh, start reading, talking, going places, listening to other people so you can recharge the battery. If not, my friend, you're going to hate this moment. And this is not good. We need you. And that's why I'm here to see you. <laughs> Recharge 